Welcome to the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm V.S. Holmes, and with me today is YA fantasy author Jenna Green. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Uh, Just to give you guys a little glimpse of her book, Reborn, I'll read the description for you. The marks on Lexiel's skin state that she is a reborn, someone who has lived before. As such, she must toil in the service to those who have only one chance at life. Sold at auction, she is fearful, but accepting of her new life. Everything changes when she must save a young child from a fate worse than death. With the help of a new ally named Finn, she flees to the wastelands. There she struggles to survive while discovering more about herself, the world, and what it truly means to be reborn. And Reborn is available on Amazon.com, so definitely grab yourselves a copy. So let's just uh, jump in and tell me a little bit about Reborn um, and also your, your inspiration for the story. Uh, So the story centers on Lexel, who is 16. Um, Unlike many other people in her society that are reborn, um, she's what's known as a late bloomer. So her marks don't appear till she is a teenager. Um, So she is thrown into slavery after having lived freely for a long time, which is very different than Mm -hmm. most people. Um, And this is about her emotional journey, uh, but also a physical journey into a strange new place, a dangerous place. Um, She's told that she is docile and accepting, but she has to challenge all that and become something she never was before. Mm -hmm. Uh, The inspiration uh, came from a meme, actually, where um, someone was making fun of uh, gingers and I have a close <laughs> friend who's a who's a ginger I'm one too it's fine <laughs> and I was like oh there you go I was like why are they always picking on gingers uh and then it made me think about my own features and my freckles which mm-hmm. I've always hated but um so it kind of spun from there uh later on after the book was finished and after it was published I kind of realized that there was a different layer of inspiration to it that Mm -hmm. I definitely did not know at the time in that my mom was diagnosed with cancer and uh, I wrote the first half of the book when she was sick and the second half uh, a couple months after she passed. So Mm -hmm. this idea of being reborn, of having marks that show that you have a connection to the past, to those people who have um, passed along. Uh, it's all layered in there, but I didn't necessarily know all those layers at the time or wasn't necessarily aware of all those layers at the time. Uh, but that's the joy of writing in that right. you can't, you kind of figure out some stuff as you go, some stuff's planned, some stuff you figure out as you go. And some you realize later, you're like, Oh, look at that. That's all connected. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I definitely think the writing process is like half you know, trying to tell the story you want to tell, and then also hearing the story that you need to hear in a lot of ways, even if we don't, we don't realize it. Oh, and characters always have a mind of their own. You've got one yeah. thing <laughs> planned, and then they go and do something else. And you're like, well, of course, that's a better idea. But you could have let me know. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I also love that you, you brought up the freckles, because that's something um, that I've I've sort of come to terms with too, because especially as I get older, like the more exposed to the sun I get, the the more freckles I get. Um, And I, I usually work outside. So it's like even, even more so. And I remember I had this, this boyfriend back in high school. And when I was like, Oh, I'm excited, you know, summer's coming, I'm going to get freckles. And he just looked at me. He was like, ew. (laughs) And I was like, excuse you. (laughs) Um, But it's, it's funny, like the, the little things you don't necessarily think of as as marks like when you're a little kid and then as you get older and you see how other people treat you based on those things um, whether it's you know yeah freckles or, or your body type or or whatever exactly tell me a little bit about incorporating reincarnation um in into your story because I, I think it's interesting that from the description it sounds like some people are reincarnated and some people aren't so talk to me a little bit about that It's more that, yeah, so it's that you've lived these previous lives and then, and, and in the book though, um, it's not clear whether that's true or not, whether, Mm -hmm. um, it's just an excuse to enslave a bunch of people. So there's characters that absolutely believe it's true. 
there's characters that mm-hmm. absolutely believe it's all crap and it's just an excuse. And then Lexel's somewhere in the middle where she hasn't really thought about it. But then as the book goes on, she starts to, and I won't give it away, she mm-hmm. starts to realize that maybe the truth is somewhat in the middle and that there is something to this. Um, she she hears voices and there are these guiding cues from people that have come before and just on a mythic level it's this idea that you know we have a connection to the past and the larger world and it's quite beautiful but um that they're punished for this is really interesting Mm -hmm. you would think that in some societies that would give them an advantage but in this society um you're punished for it it's a disadvantage Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, it definitely almost seems um, shamanistic in, in some ways, these people who have messages from somewhere else or, or some people else that, that we don't necessarily all have a connection to. Um, but I guess also, if, if I were in power, I'd want to control that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's power. You always want to be in control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Tell me a little bit about writing YA fantasy, because I know a lot of people um, have sort of talked about it being maybe a saturated market, which, I mean, as we all know, that that doesn't necessarily exist. But what have you done to sort of make your own path in this market that is hugely popular, but also, um, you know, hugely populated? So I started writing YA when I was a YA um, <laughs> for, for my Imagine series. Um, I mean, it didn't get published till I was in my early 30s, but I first came up with the concept for it. I was 17. And then I was in my Mm -hmm. early 20s, I think, when I started to kind of delve into writing it. So it's not like I sat and said, hey, this is a good genre to go into. Um, Often Mm -hmm. writing style picks the author, right? Um, Sometimes we do. We consciously are like, I'm going to try a mystery. But more more common is the idea that a story comes to you and then you choose to write it. And my characters just happen to all be teenagers. Um, I like fantasy. Uh, I read YA. I, I love YA. <laughs> um, I do read adult books sometimes, but YA is way better. Yep. It, it, there's just, you can do more in it. You can do more with it. You have more freedom. Um, it's why it's so complex because you think, oh, it's got a younger audience. You can do more things than they just believe it. Like, hey, you're a wizard, Harry. Okay, we accept <laughs> that. And, and that's that's true. But also YA is read by more adults than children or at least as much. So it's a very, it's a very weird genre if it is a genre. I've had arguments on whether it's a genre or an age group or both. And Mm -hmm. I don't know what the answer is. I think it's an age group and a genre and a style and it's, it's hard to define. Yeah. And so it's just where my characters are. They just happen to be 16 or 17 or 15. Maybe I'm not really mature. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, right. I think that, that there was a discussion um, a couple years ago, I think sort of spearheaded on Twitter, um, but obviously like crash the social media and whatnot, about all of the adults that are reading YA and, you know, the, the huge number of people who are gravitating towards it, even though, like you said, there, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, well, you know, it's it's just for kids. It's, you know, less complex. And, you know, obviously that, that might be true for, for some stories. But as a whole, I think a lot of times, you know, in those those stories, usually they they are these coming of age stories where you're discovering yourself, you're discovering that the world that you grew up in, um, you know, is isn't what you thought. Um, you know, maybe it's it's less perfect, or maybe it's you know completely broken. And now you have to find a way out of it without the help of adults. And I know you know there, there's a lot of arguments where it's like, who's who's letting these kids do this stuff, and. <laughs> You know, <laughs> probably, you know, from, from a parent's perspective, like, yeah, that's, that's a horrifying notion. But, you know, when we think about just being an adult, even, you know, you, you always have those moments where you fall back and you're like, crap, I need a grown up. <laughs> like, um, 
And I think when we gravitate towards these stories, even though they are technically directed at a younger audience, we're seeking that in ourselves. You know, we our our world isn't perfect. Our world is complicated and we need to find a way through it. And we don't always have help. And I think that's why those stories always resonate with us regardless of our age. It goes back to um, fairy tales. Mm -hmm. Fairy tales had a purpose and that was to show people in horrific, horrific situations and surviving. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were kids. The parents were dead or removed. And so they had to figure things out on their own. Um, that connects with YA in that the parents are either dead or they are absent in, uh, the hunger games, Katniss's father is dead and her mother's kind of, and then she's removed from them. Mm -hmm. Divergent. I mean, chapter what? One, two, she's in another faction. Yeah. Parents are removed. Right. Um, my character in reborn, uh, her parents are, are dead and other characters are just, either have useless parents or they're removed from them so that you give this character the opportunity to struggle, but then survive. Mm -hmm. And that's very thematic. And YA is very thematic. You think Hunger Games, you think voyeurism, you think um, identity, you think so many things. And so YA is just very layered and they can fit so many themes in it because of the pace. Mm -hmm. Um, and the pace is so fast that it's enjoyable. And so you can slide those meanings in, but you're not distracted by them. You're just kind of absorbing them because that story is keeping you interested. Things are happening fast. That's why people like YA Mm -hmm. is that there is description. There's very good descriptions, but it doesn't go on for 30 pages. Yeah. That's, that's very true. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just so much appeal to YA that it's, it is YA, but it's universal. Mm -hmm. It's just that that's the character's age. That's their maturity level, but it's going to go a thousand different directions from there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's funny that you, that you say that. Cause I think, you know, I, I mostly read, I'd say maybe 50, 50 adult YA, but the past few years I've had a huge issue with, with reading you know at first it's like oh I just I just don't have the time oh I'm too tired you know things like that and um you know later on I started to realize like I I was actually having some sort of like reader's block instead of writer's block um which you know I I always thought writer's block was the worst thing ever and and now I think I might be reader's block um but (laughs) after um it was short shortly after my dad passed um I went to a book festival and I had someone touring me around all these different books saying like oh well if you liked this thing then you'll like that and a lot of the books that I was picking up were YA which is you know not something that I read all the time and so I was sort of surprised with myself and then as soon as I started to fall into these stories it was exactly like you said you know this this fast-paced all all these themes and this richness in this world where I didn't have to work terribly hard to immerse myself in it and that's something that I hadn't thought about as being a staple of, of YA, but you're, you're so right. It's this deeper suspension of, of disbelief, which I think is so valuable. And there's so much variety to YA. There's YA fantasy. There's YA high fantasy, low fantasy, urban fantasy, dystopian. There's romance. There's the teen romps. You can get every genre into YA and it's just so diverse mm-hmm. and the creativity in the worlds that are built go from everything from human cloning to every robotics to everything. Mm -hmm. It's just this freeing genre where you can give anything a try. Yes. And it usually works. (laughs) If, well, I mean, if you do it right, right. (laughs) Yeah. So tell me Tell me a little bit about your Imagine series, because you, you sort of touched on it a bit, and then, um, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that as well. So it's an interesting series because the idea came to me when I was 17, started writing it in my 20s, uh, rewrote it from scratch oh several <laughs> times, but it's kind of where I learned, yeah, yeah, it's kind of where I learned to write. I didn't take a course. Mm-hmm. I was an English major in uh, university, but that's really studying literature and writing essays, not learning how to creatively write. Mm-hmm. So I learned how to write with this series. 
Um, it's unique that it's high fantasy because I don't read a lot of that. Mm-hmm. So it's just it's just though that the, the characters came to me and I very much follow my characters. And so if a story comes to me, I just choose it and I or it chooses me and then I choose to write it. Um, and so it's it's a high fantasy, um, you know, with magic and. There's no dragons, but there's lots of jokes about whether there is dragons. <laughs> but it's two two girls from Earth that are in this fantastical realm. And so that offers a whole different dynamic and often a lot of humor in that they don't know anything about castles or the feudal system or anything. Um, and you've got two main characters of two different ages. So you've got your surly, redheaded teenager... Uh, that's in disbelief about what has happened. And then you have your innocent bookaholic dreamer that's 10 and believes everything. Uh, And so there's an interesting dynamic between those two characters in um, how they view this new world and how they view what's happening and whether they believe it or not. And then of course, when you have such an age difference between your characters, one takes on that older sister or motherly protective role Mm -hmm. which is a theme that kind of goes through a lot of my books there's always that idea that you need to care for the younger maybe it's because I'm a teacher I don't know Mm -hmm. but this idea that there's someone you do things that maybe you don't want to do or don't feel you have the strength for but you do it on behalf of someone else that needs your protection or needs your care hey I just realized that that was a connection in all my books look at that (laughs) Um, well, I was going to ask you about themes, <laughs> but just realized it talking to you. Well, I think that is something that you do see in a lot of YA books. Is you know, there's there's a younger character, and then there's the the main character or the the older main character. And I I always thought it was a wonderful tool to sort of show what the main character is potentially leaving behind this this innocence or this wonder or um, safety, you know, and then because they have to take on these these bigger roles of, of protection or parenting um, or, you know, being a warrior, what, whatever the setting calls for, you know, you, you sort of have that, that bittersweet um, dynamic going on. Uh, but I think it's, it's also something that we can all really relate to because even if we don't have siblings, you know, oftentimes we do find ourselves in situations where we have to be the, the older person or the, or the caregiver. Um, and especially in, in hard settings, you know, I think that it's it sort of shows you the the values of your character um whether it's you know a fantastical character or not it's an interesting motivation for a character Mm -hmm. in that they might not do something for themselves they might not feel they have that ability they might not take that risk but there's someone else at stake i gotta step up Mm -hmm. and it, it i mean i was the younger sister um but it was very unique is that when I got picked on, I could not stand up to any of my bullies. But I stood up to my older sister's bullies, right. which doesn't make any sense because I was two years younger and way smaller. <laughs> but that idea of protecting someone else, it's a whole different level of motivation for you. Mm-hmm. It's a whole different draw. And, and it's very unique and interesting. Mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit about, um, you You also have a novel, Heroine. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. And um, I mean, I assume these these themes are also there too. <laughs> Heroine's kind of an outlier in that it's not a series. Everything else I've written is a series. Uh, even Reborn, I mean, the second book is at my publisher going through initial edits. So everything is a, a series mm-hmm. um, and everything's fantasy. Heroin is not a series. It's a standalone book. Um, it is YA, but it's not fantasy. Mm-hmm. The only fantasy element within it is the school play they put on in it. And um, the, the the fantasy she kind of has in her head, which are more daydreams or wishes, romantic mm-hmm. fantasies. So um, a lot of people still love it, though, because it's still got that unique style to it. Right. But it's... Um, it's also different in a lot of different ways. So you, you just said that Renew is um, is the sequel to Reborn. Um, when when can we expect that? Oh, I wish I knew. <laughs> the global 
stuff is yes <laughs> probably sooner rather than later at this rate because no one's got anything else to do but edit right. so uh <laughs> i'm working on the third because and usually uh, as a teacher i usually have to wait till summer to mm -hmm. kind of do a, the bulk of my writing but i already started on it because i was like well i've got the time so i don't know when book two will come out but uh when it does book three probably won't be very far behind it so well, that's, that's a <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just plow through and motor through it mm -hmm. so this has sort of been a, a fun question um but what what do you think um your your character lexiel would do were she to encounter this um shelter in place pandemic like what what type of role would she take up uh, if she was an adult, she'd be a nurse. She'd be caring for people. Mm -hmm. If uh, if she was, you know, just the age that she is now, she'd be looking out for other people. That's her strength mm -hmm. is that she is extremely caring. Um, it's also her weakness right. because that's how character traits go. Yeah. Um, but she is this nurturing figure. Um, it's revealed pretty early in the book that her parents died. And so she has an older brother and then a baby brother mm -hmm. and it was her job to take care of him. And, and so she's always had this nurturing quality about her and, and coming with that is a very selflessness to her mm -hmm. in that she's a giver and she's worried about others. And so that's how this, it's really important to the story and how it plays out and what paths she takes is that she is this just selfless nurturing person, mm -hmm. which just drives her to do certain things, not for her own benefit, but for the benefit of those that are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So she'd be, she'd be rounding up children. She'd be helping. <laughs> she'd be uh, delivering groceries. We could use her. <laughs> yes. She would be very helpful. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what's next for you. You know, you, you mentioned that you're, you're working on the third book as well, um, but you have, more planned in the series? Are you hoping to sort of step out and do, do something new after this? Uh, the plan is to kind of wrap up a bunch of projects. So there's Reborn, uh, the sequel Renew is at the publisher, and then I have to finish writing Restore, which is the third book. And then that will be it. it that will be it. There'll be a trilogy. Um, my Imagine series, mm -hmm. I have three out of the four books written and published. So um, I have to get book four written and published, and then that will finish up both those series. Um, and then I have another series that's been in the back of my head for a while, but I wouldn't let myself start it because like I need three series that aren't finished. Right. <laughs> Bad enough I have two series that aren't finished. Yeah. So I need, to, I need to close the door on those two series and them in a – in an appropriate way and then I can delve into some new projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of in the same position as you. I I just finished um the final book in my fantasy series and I'm wrapping up the the last two books in my sci-fi series and it's so exciting, but on the other hand, I I was just telling um one of my critique partners the other day, I'm like, this is the first time in a like pretty much since I started, you know, writing professionally that I haven't had like back burner drafts or like half finished work in progress is that I can, you know, just fiddle with or dive into like now everything, everything that's coming next is, is brand new. And that's so exciting, but also utterly terrifying. Exciting and exhausting because yes. <laughs> if you've lived in a series for a while, um, you know character names and you know their background and you know what the scenery looks like. Um, and in fantasy, as, as you would obviously know, right. um, you have to build the world. What does mm -hmm. water look like? What do they eat? Where do they live? How do they dress? And it's exhausting. It's creative mm -hmm. and it's fun. And oh, I love it. But it is tiresome. And it's a lot of daydreaming and thinking without writing to see so you know mm -hmm. what environment you're living in um and once you're in that series for a while you know everything and now you can just really work on character and plot but starting a new series is exciting because you get to come up with all sorts of new stuff but really tiring because you're like oh right wait what did i s especially with building <laughs> magical systems as i've often done mm -hmm. okay wait i, I gotta make sure i don't confuse that I, I can't change the rules 
So lots of notebooks with lots of notes yes. on <laughs> locations and yeah, especially for the Imagine series because there's so many characters and the land plays such an important role. So I have maps and diagrams and characters and species and all sorts of stuff. And it sometimes mm-hmm. I can just, I get confused. Sometimes I bring characters back from the dead and then my beta readers are like, no, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot that that happened. I better write better notes. I mean, you can, but, but you have to have like spells for that, right? <laughs> You can, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's funny. Yeah, I, I'm sort of curious how my writing like speed and process is going to change now that I'm stepping into new worlds. Because, like you said, that a lot of the work isn't actually writing, and so I'm curious to see if I've learned anything in the past, you know, like five years of <laughs> publishing. <laughs> I find the first few chapters go a little bit slower, and then you kind of get into the yeah. groove. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that's the case. I've, I have allowed myself one pet project where I follow no rules. I do no outlining. I, you know, n- nothing is safe. And so that's, I, I think that's going to be my, my sandbox for now. I'm a, I'm a hybrid. People are like, are you a plotter or a pantser? I'm like, uh, yep. Mm-hmm. There's a plot, but it's going to change. And, uh, oh, I have my best friend in the world. Uh, she sits down with me and we, we plot things out and then as I'm writing, she'll read it. And her sister's always like, why do you read it? You already know what's going to happen. Like, isn't it boring? And she's like, nope, because everything changes every time. You don't know the way it's going to happen, right? Yeah, it'll happen in a different order or a different character will be doing it. And she's like, wait, what happened? <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. That character <laughs> wanted to do it, okay? Well, I think that's true. Like a lot of... Almost everyone who I ask that that question of says I'm kind of a hybrid, you know, and, and sometimes they're they're definitely more on one side than than the other, and that's that's where the variance lies. Is is the outlining happening at first, or is it happening towards the end, or or whatnot? Uh, but I I saw someone recently talking about while everyone's being stuck at home, you know, it's like oh the extroverts are going crazy, the introverts are fine, and all all this stuff, and someone's like I think we're realizing that we're all both, <laughs> depending, yeah. and I, I think that's true for for our writing process as well. I tend to know the beginning, the end, and then I have to fill in all the middle stuff, which is the hard part. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wrote, I have like maybe, maybe 5,000 words in this, in my sandbox project. And um, I just wrote the, the last line of the entire book. And I'm like, I don't know how they get there. I don't know what they do, but <laughs> I've got the line. There's... um either a meme or a joke and it's like oh this writer's brilliant they've got their character in a situation that you know there's just no way the audience will be able to figure out how they'll get out of the situation and then you're like oh wait you're the author and you have to figure out a way for this character to get out of this situation (laughs) you've done that yourself (laughs) yeah 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 that's definitely so uh tell my my listeners where they can find you um i mean obviously no events are probably happening uh, for the foreseeable future, but <laughs> no, not right now. <laughs> no. And that's okay. Stay home. Where can they find you online? Uh, Jenna Green, green with an E on the end. Um, Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, um, on Twitter at J Green Writes, um, Facebook, again, Jenna Green with an E on the end, Instagram, my website, Jenna Green.ca, uh, the podcast. Quill and Ink with Miranda O and myself. <laughs> I think that's it. Awesome. And um, I, I think your books are also available as paperbacks as well. Can um, yeah. can people order them through their bookstores or is it just Amazon for now? Uh, Amazon or Chapters. They're connected. So yeah, either one. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. It's a really fun way to, to break up the quarantine, hear a nice, you know, friendly author voice on the, on the other end. Thanks for having me. And uh, it was really fun learning about your series. Thank you so much. Yay. This has been the Amphibian Press Podcast. I'm V.S. Holmes. With me today was Jenna Green. Thank you so much for listening.